So we're calling this video series Theology of Quran, but can we really classify Quran as a book of theology? And this is an important question. And I just want to make the point initially that uh, usually Muslims, scholars and uh, ordinary believers look at Quran as a book that covers, encapsulates many truths or many aspects of life and existence social, theological, even historical, scientific, you know, we could address that in, in another video as well, uh, that the Quran has many aspects. Uh, that makes it applicable, uh, perhaps universal, and even also it be able to address many issues that may come in time. So it is a, it's not like any other book that has certain segments uh, saying that this is theological chapter, this is a legal chapter, and this is spiritual chapter. Uh, many aspects of religion, in a complete way, encapsulated in the chapters and the verses of the Quran, uh, in a blend that is unique to itself. And most, some people find that troubling because they do not, they're not used to a book like that, and they don't understand uh, how to un uh, appreciate the Quran. And perhaps I'll do a a separate video about that. But is, can we, having putting that aside, that the Quran can be labeled under, with many titles, can we really say Quran is a book of theology? And I think we can. And there are a number of reasons for it. Uh, firstly, when we say, when you look at any book scholar, consult any scholar, and ask what are the major themes of the Quran? And they will say three, that the Quran is about Tawheed, which is uh, unity and existence of God. Uh, it's about Akhira, meaning afterlife, uh, and Risale, which means uh, prophethood. Now, all these three aspects are really, it's about theological topics, aren't they? It's matters of belief or matters that pertain to belief. Now, uh, other scholars add uh, different themes to the Qur'an. Like for example, uh, what are we going to do with verses that are related to commandments? Uh, so they say there's a fourth uh, theme which is called uh, worship, or uh, the Qur'an regulates or outlines principles of human conduct, human transactions. Uh, some scholars say that is uh, justice, the principle or theme of justice that uh, passes throughout the whole Qur'an. So basically we could say uh, to those three theological themes, there is a theme related to human beings, individuals and collective human communities and societies. Um, but there's, uh, so that means if you go with that four main themes, that means 75% of the Qur'an are about roughly uh, matters of theology. Uh, actually, there's an uh, author, uh, Farooq Sharif, he's written a book called A Guide to the Contents of the Qur'an. And he went through every verse and tried to classify every verse under a theme. And he came up with eight themes, and he gives us precise percentages. Let me just give you what these are. Creator and his creatures, 16%. Afterlife, 21.5%. Uh, Prophet and the Quran, 11.6%. Previous barriers of divine message, 22.6%. Faith and religion, 12.9%. And the last two are the commandments, 12.2%. And some historical events, 3.3%. So according to Farag Sheriff's calculations, only 16% of the Qur'an can be classified as non-theological. So that makes 84% of it largely a theological content. That's very large. Um, and Sheriff adds that nearly 28% of the Qur'an describes God and God's attributes uh, in one shape or form. So I think this is an overwhelming uh, analysis in terms of the themes of the Qur'an, that it is a book uh, about topics of theology. But some could argue that uh, 
Previously, in our previous definition of theology, we talked about how theology responds to particular time and place. For example, so a Quran is timeless, P people may argue. Well, really, if you, if you examine the Quran and its uh, rhetoric, the content and the style, um, it is addressing to the theological problems of its time. Polytheism, Judaism, Christianity, you know, monotheism, uh, perhaps uh, the issue of interpretation of religion. So these were very much there in that time. So it is responding to the, its time. And one could argue that if Quran is universal, and surely Muslims believe that, it's mu it must also respond to theological problems that will arise in some time in, uh, in now and in the future. So it makes it once again a theologically relevant book or contextually relevant book. Or some people may say that, well, in theology, theology is about ra reason, about rational uh, explanations of matters of theology, uh, and Quran doesn't do that. Well, I disagree because Quran does actually provide uh, logical arguments for its propositions of faith. Like, for example, uh, in uh, the verse 30, uh, chapter 30, verse 50 in the Quran, it says, uh, uh, look upon the creation of God's mercy, how he gives life to earth after its death, and so will be your resurrection. And God is all powerful, uh, powerful over all things. So even though this is just a very short sentence, there is a rational argument in this verse. What it's saying is that, uh, look around you, how the, the soil, the earth that looks dead, and the rain comes, and it comes to alive. So if the earth can come alive like that, then your dead bones, when you die, you can also come back to life. And since it is true that the earth does come alive in terms of vegetation and animal life, through rain, what it appears to be dead, and then so the resurrection will be true. So there is a, actually, this is a logical form uh, Imam Ghazali used verses like this to justify in a book why logic is Islamic or Quranic. So, and he actually said that he, he appeals to Abraham particularly to argue that, well, if a Prophet Abraham, peace be upon him, provided rational explanations or used logic to reason with people, then he came before the Greeks. In, according to Imam Ghazali, uh, Greeks learned logic or reasoning from the prophets like Moses and Abraham and, and others that came before the Greek philosophers. So I'm not talking about here that the Quran is definitely, is, it's not a book of dry logic because that would be boring, too abstract for ordinary readers. Uh, I mean, one of the strengths of the Quran is that it appeals to people of different intellectual and educational uh, of, of status and levels. Uh, but if you really look at it closely, it does provide reasons for its propositions, even commandments. Like commandments like, uh, for instance, it says there is uh, life in uh, Qisas. Qisas meaning capital punishment. I mean, we can look at that in a separate video uh, whether capital punishment should be or shouldn't be, that's a different matter. But the fact that li there's life in uh, Qisas, capital punishment, is a rational argument. It's saying that uh, you could save lives through you know, the threat of uh, capital punishment, or in the case of a, let's say, a serial killer, uh, through capital punishment, uh, you can save many lives that that murderer could have uh, ended. So, so you're saving lives with that punishment. So it's a it's a argument. You may disagree with that. I know that the Western legal system uh, or the contemporary approach to capital punishment is different, but that's beside the point. So my point is that uh, even though in its bare uh, bones and skeleton, 
uh, Quran does provide uh, reason or rational arguments for its propositions of faith. So essentially that makes it a book of theology.